In this segment, we're going to dive into semantics. This is a bit of a shift of gears from what we've been looking at so far. We've talked a lot about different syntactic representations of language, but now we're going to move on to semantics. And so the syntactic representations we've built up so far don't say a whole lot about word meaning. So we're going to see that although they still had useful properties in terms of uh, modeling things like prepositional phrases and how words relate to each other, uh, they don't allow us the sort of deep kind of processing that semantics is going to. Uh, but there are trade-offs where syntax is very general purpose and very easy to apply, whereas we're going to see that the semantic representations that we use here are, in a lot of cases, sort of brittle and hard to scale. So this is also going to be our segue into end-to-end -end models like sequence-to-sequence -sequence that allow us to kind of circumvent this formal stuff altogether. So one approach to semantics which we're not going to talk about right now is grounding, where we take individual like words and sentences and associate them with real world concepts. So uh, for example, a, an example of perceptual grounding is if you take the word red and rather than just seeing it as a symbol or some property that things can have, um, you know, you can actually associate it with say certain ranges of RGB values you get from a sensor, right? Where it should indicate that the robot or whatever is actually perceiving the color red. So, we're not going to look at this so much right now. We're going to talk about uh, what we'll call formal semantics, where we can essentially convert language into a sort of logical representation. This is going to be useful for some tasks that we're going to think about, like question answering and database querying. Uh, and we're going to come back to the idea of grounding later. So, we're going to start by talking about model theoretic semantics. And the idea is that a natural language expression can be written as a set theoretic expression, which we call a model. And what we're doing is we're taking a sentence or a statement and in converting it into what we call an interpretation. So if we have the sentence, she likes going to that restaurant, in order to figure out really what this means, there's a little bit of extra work we need to do in order to define it. For example, we might need to figure out what who she is and what that restaurant refers to, right? Uh, and that is going to allow us to evaluate this statement with respect to what we call a world. Basically, we are talking about this particular person and this restaurant and the fact that she likes this restaurant, and is this a true statement or not? So, this is going to allow us to define things like entailment in a concrete way. So we've previously kind of briefly seen the task of entailment, like if you say a boy is playing in the snow, that entails the statement a boy is outside because, well, very likely the boy in this case uh, has to be outside in order to be playing in the snow. And now we can make this notion that we defined informally concrete. We could say that sentence A entails sentence B if in all worlds where A is true, B is also true. And so what this kind of formal semantics is going to allow us to do is it's going to make us allow us to be a little bit more precise about uh, you know, what we talk about when we talk about this kind of reasoning over language. So we are going to define all this stuff in terms of first order logic. First order logic is a pretty powerful formalism that is going to allow us to express various things like entities and relationships between those entities and uh, use quantification, etc. So if we have the statement Lady Gaga sings, sings is what we call a predicate. This is a function that in this case is going to take an entity and map it to either true or false. Uh, and so we think of this as uh, taking Lady Gaga as an argument and sings Lady Gaga is a statement that we can evaluate against our world or what we could think of as a database, right? If we just had a list of all the people who are singers, we can ask, is Lady Gaga in this list? And sometimes we're going to use this double bracket notation around uh, a predicate or a, a sentence, and this refers to the denotation. Um, basically, what happens when you actually execute this on the world? And in this case, sings is a function that we could think of like a filter. So it's going to go through your database and return the set of entities who sing. So 
the you know the the way that we, the way that we think about these relations i mean you have to stretch your brain a little bit to imagine that we've enumerated all the singers but you know basically we have this giant lookup table and now the way that we're going to take our sentences and kind of formally reason about them is with respect to that database all right so quantification is one feature of first order logic that's going to be pretty helpful for us uh, so we have universal quantification, which allows us to write expressions like this. For all x, sings of x, or dances of x, implies performs of x. And so in natural language, you might express this as everyone who sings or dances performs, or is a performer, right? So there might be many different surface representations that map onto the same underlying logical representation. We have existential quantification, which lets us, which allows us to uh, to kind of make concrete statements like there exists x where sings of x is true, someone sings. And so this is going to let us, uh, you know, give us a tool that's going to allow us to, rep to uh, represent a wider range of meanings in this, uh, in, you know, in this language. Uh, but it's also a source of ambiguity. So if we have the statement everyone is friends with someone, there's actually two interpretations of this. And so I'm going to list those here, and you can think about them and see if you can come up with the meanings for each of these. So the first one here says, for all x, there exists y such that x and y are friends, right? And so this means basically that uh, everyone has someone who is their friend. The second statement here says, there exists y such that for all x, uh, X is friends with Y. And so this means that there is someone who uh, is friends with everyone, actually. Uh, and so back in the old days of the first social net, big social network, MySpace, there was Tom who, whenever you joined MySpace, Tom would automatically be in your friends list. And so uh, just think about Tom in this case. You know, he's, he's the person who happens to be friends with everyone here. So why are these logical representations going to be useful? We're going to see that it's actually fairly hard to work with them to do general purpose NLP stuff. So as much as we motivated this from ideas of entailment, um, actually doing entailment with this is pretty challenging. But what they end up being really good at is, are, is tasks like question answering. Um, so if we ask, who are all the American singers named Amy? Uh, this question is very naturally executed against a database if we have a big database of singers. Uh, and so we could form an expression here in lambda calculus. Uh, so this is a function that takes an argument x. So think of it again like a filter function that's going to execute over our database. We ask if x has nationality USA, x is a singer, and x's first name is Amy. So if we could take this, this question, convert it into this representation, then we, then we have something that looks like code, right? And we can just execute this against our database, assuming we have information about nationality, sings, and first name. So the, you know, the reason we use this lambda calculus representation is it's a, it's a pretty powerful way of expressing these functions that's going to let us, uh, we'll see in a little bit, build up bigger rep, you know, representations of bigger pieces from smaller pieces. It's going to be very compositional in a way that uh, makes it very useful for uh, interpreting natural language. And a second application is information extraction. So if we say something like Lady Gaga and Eminem are both musicians, uh, we can represent this again very naturally uh, in terms of these uh, semantic representations. And this is also, again, going to allow us to do reasoning. For example, if we find a statement like, you know, every musician is a performer, which looks like this, then suddenly we have information about, uh, you know, whether these people are performers as well. So the nice thing about this is it lets us take, uh, it lets us take statements in natural language where it's otherwise a little bit hard to say whether they're true or false, make them concrete, and then execute them against this database. And if the big caveat is that we need this database to execute them against, and so this only makes sense in certain domains. But regardless, it's going to be a very useful language for talking about tasks like these. And so we're going to explore some of what this looks like uh, going forward. That's the end of this segment.